All right, uh, let's begin. Um, welcome to the October Forum of Climate Kind Revisited. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I want to go through some announcements of my own. And if others have announcements, uh, <coughs> let me know. Up here, there's some information on um, upcoming activities uh, that um, the Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative is involved in. Uh, there's a November 2nd all-day meeting here in room 200 on um, the uh, second annual Wolf Lake Watershed Advisory Committee meeting. Um, we have also a leaflet on the uh, 13th annual Greening of the Arts show, reception, and concerts. And um, for the last 10 years, we've always had a lecture on, on the nexus of art and nature. But this year, um, we decided, instead of having a lecture, to have a series of five concerts. So, um, um, and this will be on uh, consecutive Fridays for the um, run of the, um, of the art show. Um, and we'll see um, how we do. The, um, but the uh, opening of the show is on Friday, October 19th, and um, then we'll have concerts that evening, and then on um, October 26th, November 2nd, November 9th, and November 16th. And actually, the I have a leaflet. I'll have a leaflet on each of the five concerts. This one happens to be on the November 16th concert. Uh, it's a woodwind group uh, that will be performing that evening. And um, that all of the concerts will be in the uh, uh, Black Box Theater, except for Brother Ben. Will give a. Uh, this concert will be in the uh, gallery because uh, that's where the organ is, and we're not going to move the organ. I'm told. Um, so those are my announcements. Uh, does anyone else have announcement of upcoming events or, or otherwise? Um, so this evening uh, we have. Um, Walter Skiba, to, that will give you the, his third installment of the history of Calumet College. And um, if you were at his previous talks, um, uh, the, really the original one was on the uh, East Chicago campus, and he was um, teaching them. So Walter's been uh, living this history. and. Uh, and he'll be giving his third installment, and next year his fourth installment, and and we'll see what happens after that. At least, yeah, I was teaching. We're not part of that time. But part of that time, yes. It's very, very tail end of the Chicago. Okay. Okay, so Walter? Is anybody else coming yet? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I'll walk. Do we need the lights or the lights? Well, this is the this is the best uh, setup, I think. Um, maybe, yeah. So we could see the. Uh, that images. looks good. Yeah, I think it does too. Yeah. Yeah. I promised uh, Don. I know Don said he has a Lions Club meeting tonight after this that we'd be done with by six o'clock, and we should. All all things come uh, considering we're done by six o'clock, starting a few minutes late, but uh, not that much. My, my third installment, Mike mentioned the first one. Uh, the, the second one had to do with the MOOC uh, here uh, from me, Chicago. I focused on what was going on before the MOOC and the problems that surfaced uh, afterwards. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the what I call the Rittenmeyer Katsanias era. It lasted uh, 24 years, from uh, 1987 to uh, 2011. And I, 
I've come to the conclusion that while, while both uh, both were very good, Dennis Rittenmeyer, president of the college, Tom Katsanias was chair, uh, chairman of the board all that time, but they were very good individually, but the, the two were greater, I think, than the sum of their parts. And I, I said that to both of them, and they, uh, you know, they agreed rather easily. But I'm going to start off with Rittenmeyer's retirement, then go back to the very beginnings as to how he got hired, and some of the uh, turmoil he faced at the very beginning. And then I'm going to jump to the founding of the athletic program. In the, the athletic program began in the year 2000, and it's certainly one of uh, Rittenmeyer's greatest accomplishments, I'd say along with the uh, master's degree programs. And I would put uh, the athletic program first. It's, it's the most visible, and it, it just radically changed the character of our campus. And Andy Marks, uh, Director of Enrollment, and involved with the athletic program almost from the uh, very beginning. I'm going to have him take over uh, for the last uh, 15 minutes or so to, uh, to talk about the startup of the program and, and stories uh, from, uh, well, stories from various years, right? Yeah, developments of all kinds. So, so June seventh, two thousand eleven. This is a picture from uh, the, uh, the retirement uh, that took place at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, that's where it was held. And this picture, you recognize the uh, individuals in there? You probably do. Of course, Dennis is on. The right as you're facing the screen looks pretty happy to me who's in the middle yeah a u.s congressional representative uh, pete Viskolowski, uh, who also read a tribute to rittmeyer into the congressional record and it's available online and right here bishop dale melchuk yeah, three So we've got a couple, another picture. Rittenmeyer looks pretty happy, I would say. And I'm going to uh, talk about Tom Katsanias, too, and close up, and another picture. This is from 2014, April, when he was inducted into the Northwest Indiana Times Hall of Fame for Business and Industry. He was uh, 85 years old at the time, and as, as uh, right now he's you know, 90 years old and still uh, still going fairly strong. So I'll go back to the picture of uh, right here that we could focus on, and I'm going to just give a, give a few quotes from from the uh, from the parties and tributes to Rittenmeyer and start off with, with something that he said first. And typical of him, he spoke about the students and alumni of the college. Our students and alumni are bright, creative, and motivate us to continue to strive to offer an academically challenging and flexible learning environment. I asked Cassanius what he considered uh, uh, very important about all those years or significant achievement. And he said the students, that the quality of education and uh, alumni. Representative uh, Pete Visklosky thanked Rick Meyer for his commitment to education and to the region, um, various leadership roles. And he called him a man of faith. Bishop Melchuk of the Gary uh, Diocese at the time referred to Rittenmeyer as a wonderful servant. He noted uh, that when Rittenmeyer took office, the college was in debt with declining enrollment 
and Rittmeyer rose up to the challenge of, quote, sharpening its vision and strengthening its Catholic identity. And that's quite a compliment, uh, of, of course, but especially given the fact that uh, Rittmeyer was uh, not Catholic, Presbyterian. Only the, the second lay person in the state of Indiana to become president of a Catholic, uh, Catholic church affiliated college, and an un-Catholic at that. And I should mention the, the, the two presidents following Rittenmeyer, Dr. Lowry and Dr. Amy McCormick, Catholicism was a very prominent uh, uh, part of, of their uh, application and, and um, consideration. Not only the fact that they identified as Catholic, but they were practicing Catholics. That was a very important uh, uh, component. So how could, back in 1987, how could someone who uh, wasn't even Catholic uh, get hired? And that's quite a story. I don't have permission, unfortunately, to reveal some of the details, but there are enough to, uh, to uh, I think, that you'll be uh, satisfied with. I'm going to take you back. I'm going to get out of here. And take you back to 1986, 1987 here, and Richard Melchick referred to the state of the college's uh, finances. And there were three main problems. Number one, the college was in debt <coughs> for remodeling and renovating these facility, facilities and a few uh, um, additional um, expenses. And the original originally borrowed two million, then two point five million total at eight percent uh, interest. And eight percent interest comes out to two hundred thousand dollars a year, and uh, that's a lot of money. Now, in 1986-87 dollars, we're talking about four. It would be worth about four times as much today. So two point. Uh, it, the debt had mounted to, to uh, between 3.5 and 4 million, it's tough to say. But today that debt, you know, multiply it by four. So 16 million, 15, 16 million in today's dollars. That's a, that's a huge amount. Okay. And the college was not making any payments on the debt. The second, um, major concern was the operational deficits. They had been running about $250,000, $300,000, and they, that's how they ran. Uh, the fiscal year, July 1st, uh, 1986 to June 30th, 1987, operational deficit. Again, you can multiply that by four to get some idea of what that amounts to in today's dollars. The third major issue was the enrollment and credit hour decline. 1971 72 was the peak year for enrollment and credit hours. And as you can see here, the annual credit hours over 39,000, 18,000, less than half, less than 50%. Enrollment, and I'm going by the full time equivalent in 1971, $1,157, down to 508, fall of 1986. Again, uh, more than half down from its, uh, uh, its beginning. Now, there was a slight enrollment increase in the fall of uh, 1987, as you could see, but that increase which I'll explain had nothing to do with uh, uh, the work of Rittenmeyer or uh, Katsanius. So, but you have a picture of the uh, financial state of the college at that time. Uh, 
I was very interested. I, I, when I, I recall it, the hiring of Rick Meyer seemed very sudden. I looked at four documents from the year 1987, the summer. I figured I'd learn, well, what really happened? Something must have been going on behind the scenes um, at that time. There's nothing, zero. No indication, no hint of uh, a search for a president. There's no letter of resignation from Father Schimmel. No announcement even. Articles, article from the newspapers that uh, Rittenmeyer had been. The only mention, the first mention of Rittenmeyer is in the minutes of the July board meeting where he is listed as president all of a sudden. So, But there was quite a bit uh, happening behind the scenes. Father Schimmel was the president. He was the last uh, precious blood priest uh, to be uh, uh, president. He had come to the college in the mid-60s and served in various capacities in development uh, and as property manager here for a while and worked his way up to executive vice president under Father Osterhage. Father Osterhage resigned at the end of uh, the calendar year 1985, and there there is a letter of resignation. There are letters of resignation from all previous presidents, but nothing for, from Father Schimmel, as I as I um, said before. The college began to conduct a search for a new president and advertised in the Chronicle of Higher Education and elsewhere, and got some applications, but decided to stay with the precious blood and Father Schimmel and appointed him president beginning July 1st, 1986. But after leading a um, concerted effort to get the Hammond City Council to approve a plan to deepen Lake uh, George, or George Lake, the lake uh, right behind us for recreational purposes, and realize revenue from the sale of sand to uh, cut into the debt and uh, the annual deficits. Uh, after um, that effort failed, Father Schimmel simply didn't know what to do. That's the best explanation uh, for it. He intended to stay on as president. He was determined to keep the school open, but he didn't know how. I just got uh, uh, literally no plan at all, and uh, that you know that's important. This one. The next player in the process is um, Tom Katsanius, as you, uh, you saw his picture. He spent he uh, spent 36 years at uh, Inland Steel, the old Inland Steel Company in uh, East Chicago. Kind of worked his way up, served in every department, what I read, but became, in effect, uh, the chief operating officer and kept the industry profitable in some, you know, very, very trying times in the 1980s, but uh, retired in 1986 from Inland Steel. Father Schimmel hired him at the college as a consultant to examine the school's finances and make recommendations to, uh, to turn things around. Katsanias uh, joined the board, and not long afterwards, when uh, the chair resigned, that he became chairman of the board. This is spring of, uh, 2000, uh, of 1986. So to examine the finances, he got uh, the services of a retired accountant from Inland Steel, whom he respected and knew well. And the accountant found the financial records in disarray, as I have, looking at them. It's, they're incomplete, they're sometimes contradictory. There were checks um, just scattered in drawers, uh, bills, and so forth. So it took him much longer than anticipated several months 
to come up with a report, to have enough data to come up with a report and recommendations. Well, the report showed just a very dire condition, something far worse than Kitsanius or anyone else realized. The college was within three months from closing. That's what the, that's what the report said. So Katsanius felt that the leadership change was necessary at this point, even though, again, as I said before, Father Schimmel uh, did not intend to resign. So he consulted with, and he had two or three weeks, he said, to find a new president. That's all. There was no time to do a search, which would take several months and, um, and more. So he had two to three weeks. So he consulted with Father Kalaki, the uh, provincial of the Precious Blood Order at the time, and Bishop Gaughan, the, um, the head of the uh, Gary Diocese, um, and looking for a priest. Uh, there, was, there was no one from the Precious Blood Order available, and no, there was a suitable candidate from the diocese, but he was uh, not available at the time. So Catanius then undertook some, what I would call, bold, unprecedented, and decisive moves. Remember I said earlier that the college had begun a search for a president? One of the applicants uh, was Dennis Rittenmeyer, and Catanius was impressed with his application. So who was Dennis Rittenmeyer? Dennis uh, Rittmeyer grew up in Hobart, attended uh, Hobart uh, High School, and then went on to earn a PhD in higher education administration from the University, of, from Michigan State University. And then went on to, uh, to hold administrative positions at the State University of New York, at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, and January 1985, a job at Purdue, at Purdue Calumet, brought him back to the region. The position of executive dean, just uh, below the chancellor, a second in command to the chancellor, as he put it. But things were not working out well there, and he was uh, open to uh, other opportunities. Let's say he learned about the the, the uh, job from a graduate student at Purdue, whose boyfriend was the son of one of the, one of our board members at the time. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, interestingly enough. So Catanius decided to interview Rittenmeyer one on one first. He did this at an off-campus site. The, the, the issue was just too sensitive, he felt, to meet you know, somewhere on campus. So, a non-Catholic, the idea of a non-Catholic, and also Father Schimmel had some, something of a, a following, too. So he interviewed Grittenmeyer one-on-one. And I, I said, what were some questions you asked him? What were you looking for in the interview? And he said, I wanted to find out if he could run a large company. That was my main. He conducted many interviews of candidates for department heads at Inland Steel, and he said he knew what questions to ask, what to look for. And he was satisfied. He felt uh, Rittenmeyer was um, ideal for the job. So he presented Rittenmeyer to the board, let, let them uh, board members interviewed him, again, at an off-campus site. You know, nobody knew of uh, any of this, or very, very few people, let's say, uh, at best knew any of this was uh, going on. Board members accepted Rittenmeyer, too, you know, unanimously. And that's their job, the board. The first job of the board is to select a president. So, Catanius was ready, then, to make his move. 
you went to uh, Father Simmel and asked him to resign. <coughs> talked about it was not a pleasant meeting as I understand father Simmel did resign but there okay there's no letter of, of resignation but father Schimmel did agree to resign and Cassanius announced the appointment July 1st 1987 that's when uh, Rittmeyer came in and uh, took office then I wondered and I asked uh, 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 Cassanius this question, what, what made him so determined to, uh, to save the college? Huh? What made him buy into the school? Because he could have just said, uh, yeah, well, after the economic, uh, the report, the financial report, that, well, we tried. You know, we did the best we could, but I guess we're going to have to close down. And he could have uh, very easily just, uh, just taken that step. He told me a few things. He said he attended a graduation and he saw how much how much it meant to the students. And he said some of the students were close to his age. He, he was just deeply moved by the graduation event. He met with students and got to like them and, and saw that the college really meant something to them. And he said he was impressed with the dedication of faculty who were the lowest paid in the state of Indiana at that time, by the way. So that kind of a combination of things, but he was determined to keep them, you know, keep the school going. It was not easy for uh, Rittenmeyer at the first. Uh, in fact, uh, not long after he um, assumed the presidency, Father Schimmel came to his office, congratulated him, and said, oh, I have, to, I have to tell you something. There's not enough money in the bank to meet the next payroll. <laughs> yeah, what a thing to say, this uh, meets the summer payroll. And the college credit with the banks was bad, very bad. The banks were not willing to loan the college uh, money. Well, they managed to get a loan because there was one bank, Mercantile National Bank at that time, in downtown Hammond, uh, whose president was uh, Joe Morrow, a graduate uh, of, the, of the college. So when they got him to uh, initially loan them some money, and they had to, uh, at, at various times, had to co-sign for the loans, take out a second mortgage just to, less like parents co-sign for, uh, for a, uh, a child's loan. So they uh, both were, it just shows the extent of uh, their uh, dedication. But believe it or not, uh, the first year, they were able to turn things around uh, from a 250 plus thousand dollar deficit to a surplus and the surplus continued every year thereafter for 24 years the balance the budget was always the balance uh, with a uh, with the surplus left over and how did he do that I okay, that's a good question. Yeah, to raise the tuition for one thing. Yes. Add uh, more classes. Well, I asked I asked uh, Tom Katsanius that same question. How could you do it? You know, three three hundred thousand dollar deficit one year, and there wasn't uh, they didn't make that many you know, big sudden changes. And Katsanius said I had to cut four hundred million dollars at uh, Inland Steel. He said, you know, 300,000 wasn't, I think, yeah, <laughs> he was modest, but, you know, that's uh, what he said. But no big changes were made. No tuition hike? Ah, there may have been a tuition hike, oh, but I think so. there was an increase. Now, there was something that happened that neither Rittenmeyer nor Katsanius uh, uh, was involved in and, and to, would take any credit for it. But 1987 was the year that the 
accelerated degree program began in organization management. So the enrollment, in fact, there were 63 students enrolled that semester and alone. There were three groups and six groups and that year and six to eight groups for, for many years thereafter. So that brought in uh, additional revenue. Uh, Rick Meyer was not hesitant to raise tuition, more so than it had been raised uh, before as well. And they made some cuts, but it, not all that much. Vicki Miller, some of you may uh, know Vic, uh, Vicki Miller, a very good handwriting analyst, and he is a very good person, very entertaining as well. But after Rittenmeyer took off, as she said to me, he's a real mover and shaker. You know, he's going to bring in some big changes uh, to the operation. But it didn't seem like that uh, at first. At first, it seemed like things were running um, pretty much as usual. Let's see, just a but, uh, but things began to uh, turn around. So I'll lead up to the um, athletic, uh, beginning of the athletic program. What was going on then? This is a graph that uh, Rittenmeyer would show every, show faculty every year at the convocations and sometimes at uh, meetings. And what I'm going to do focus on the last part of it. Notice there was a rise in enrollment, 89.90 to 92.93. Uh, and the rise coincided with the uh, well, with the recession going on in the country, just people out of work uh, and all that. So the recession brought in quite a few adults, and I recall very well uh, those years. I was uh, I, I taught speech in the su summers for you know, many, many years, and there were two summers, 92 and 93, that, that I had over 30 students. I was asked to take in more students. Uh, in the night classes, and most of them were adults, anyway. But with uh, what Clinton took office, Greenspan uh, um, ran the Treasury, and um, the economy picked up quite a bit. The traditional enrollment went down, as you could see, just a slow but uh, uh, steady decrease, and that was a concern. Just. We need something to bring in traditional enrollment. Now, right before nineteen ninety nine profile, I'll just uh, hit some highlights from it. This is before the athletic program began, fall nineteen ninety. Degree completion and traditional are lumped together somewhat. A degree completion refers to the accelerated program, and at that time, law enforcement, public or public safety had joined organization management. So, but 699 traditional, 1,003 overall, but 30 percent of the school was enrolled in the accelerated program. 70 percent traditional. Part-timers, 65% of the school was uh, part-time then. Okay. White, non-Hispanic, about 48%, 45%. Now today, um, it's over 50%, 55 at least uh, um, 
black and Hispanic. Thirteen percent of the student body were traditional college age approximately. The biggest, uh, the largest group was forty to forty-nine year olds. Two hundred sixty-three, more than twice the uh, uh, average age, thirty-five years. More night students than day students, and more night classes. Uh, as well. So, Illinois, 24%. That was about about average of uh, what the school was running at that time. So, Wittenmeyer and others were looking for something to bring in more traditional uh, students. Jim Aducey played a role in the process, and I'm going to turn this over to Andy now, as I said I could. Thank you, Walter. Yeah. So as uh, Walter mentioned, uh, that Jim Aducci played a huge role uh, in the creation of athletics. He's the one who actually approached Dennis Rittenmeyer and uh, convinced him that athletics uh, is what the school needed, one, to make uh, student life thrive, uh, to bring in traditional students, uh, and just to kind of make it a more legitimate traditional campus for our students. Um, he approached Dennis sometime in early January, February of 1999. Um, and it didn't take uh, long for uh, Jim to uh, convince Dennis of, of athletics. And I think for a lot of us who have been around, it didn't take uh, Jim long to convince Dennis of a lot of things. Uh, if, if Jim was on board with it, uh, Dennis was kind of on board with it. Um, I have a picture here of, of the day that they, they started athletics. So uh, it's an interesting photo. It has uh, Tom Cassanius, uh, which Walter's talked about, uh, Dennis Rittenmeyer in the middle. Uh, and the provincial uh, father at the time. Uh, and this is from March 18th, 1999. Um, and this was basically the day they signed on uh, to become an NAI athletic school, uh, the day they announced that we were gonna have athletics at Kelly College, and uh, the day they started the search for an athletic director. And uh, Andy Jusek told me a lot of stories about the time and being in 1999, 2000, what it was like, but uh, he's, uh, Andy Jusek owned a sports store right on 119th Street. Um, making jerseys, ordering bags, things like that for teams. And he says, uh, a gentleman named Dennis Rittmeyer walked into my sports store one time and I said, you know, how can I help you? I got my pad of paper out and I started ready to write notes. And uh, he said, well, I'm not, I'm not here to buy any athletic equipment. And he's like, well, I don't, I don't sell anything else. I don't know what you are in my store for. And he says, well, uh, I'm here to hire you. And Andy says, well, I own my own business. I'm not really here for hire. And he said, no, we want you to be athletic director here at Kelly McCollege. College. And they had a few conversations. Andy came over for lunch one day. And uh, at the end of lunch, he closed his sports store down um, and became the athletic director. And Andy tells the story of um, being where actually enrollment was now. So uh, if anybody knows where Becky Levy's office was, that's where Andy Jusick's office is. And uh, he said there was a desk, a phone on it, a pen that said Kelly McCollege, College, and a pad of paper. And that's what he walked into to start athletics here. Uh, and so Andy, you know, Andy had been a long time uh, basketball coach at, at Bishop Knoll Institute and just a long time, you know, member of the community. And so he knew a lot of people. Uh, so we started down the path to hire coaches. And I'm going to give a brief kind of explanation uh, of what Andy talks about when, you know, hiring coaches. He was coach of the year a couple of times. He was. Right, right? He was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andy said the hardest part about being an athletic, an athletic director at the beginning of starting a sports program was hiring coaches, hire people that you could rely on. Uh, so when he first started hiring a coach, um, he hired a, a graduate of Bishop Knoll. Um, that he thought, okay, hire. I, I knew him when he was in high school. This could be a good hire. He knows the area really well. And um, unfortunately, it came to find out that the young man had been some, some, some had some mental issues and, and things like that, and really needed to care for himself, not uh, become a coach of a college team. Uh, and so Andy called uh, his daughter, uh, who was actually in the sports information department at Northwestern University, and said. Uh, you know, I'm looking for a coach. You know anybody? She said, Dad, I, I know this great, great young guy he just graduated from Northwestern. Um, he, he's really wanting to coach, and that's how we hired Nate Pomaday. Um, and so it really boosted us when we hired Nate Pomaday. Nate Pomaday was a full ride scholarship athlete from Northwestern University, had been in all the Chicago papers and things, and his name kind of came here. And he was young, he was 22 at the time. 
um, was really ambitious about recruiting. So uh, Andy took over the, the women's basketball program that they started, and, and, and Nate Pomade was the men's coach, and they, they went and recruited. So in the fall of 2000, we opened up in, in October of that year playing Judson University uh, with two teams, men and women's uh, uh, basketball. And in the spring of, of that year, they played baseball as a club team. Um, and it's important to know it's a club team because there's a lot to do with the history and athletics of stats and things like that. Because it was club, those things really don't count as, as true official records. Um, it does for us as a historical standpoint, but not really in the record books. Uh, so as we move into the fall of 2001, um, we added, uh, you know, we had men and women's basketball, we had baseball, we added softball that year, and we had four teams going strong. Uh, and as you guys can see, it'll, it'll spiral through. The next uh, year, women's volleyball. Um, became a sport. Uh, men's volleyball becomes a sport, uh, and we started into women's soccer. Um, and soon after that, we bring men's soccer on board. Um, and we stay that way for a little while. You know, we stay, we stay right there for a little while. And towards uh, the fall of 2005, we start cross country. Um, and as we as we evolve there, um, I think everybody who knows uh, Andy Jusick really well knows his wife got very ill. Um, at the time, and Andy started spending a lot of time, you know, with his wife. So there was a concern to have assistant athletic directors in the program. And as we're expanding athletes, hire an athletic trainer. Um, and this is where the department starts really expanding. Uh, they moved downstairs to the basement, and basically the basement, uh, which was really used by Mark Martinez for photography and things, becomes an athletic department. Um, and it's interesting because the rooms really aren't suited for athletics. So you kind of have a makeshift weight room, and you have coaches and offices, and you have double coaches and offices down there. Um, and it's kind of a weird feeling as, you know, as an athlete usually walks into a gym. Uh, when you meet your coach, you walk down into a basement, and there's no gym there. And, and throughout all this time, we're playing at the Hammond Civic Center. Um, and the Civic Center is, is a great site, you know, it's historical and it has a lot of great basketball games and things there and a lot of good volleyball stuff that's going on there. But it's a 5,000 seat stadium and a small college is not going to seat 5,000 for the game. So you go in there and you have a crowd of 300 and you feel like you have 10 people, you know, and it's a really good crowd. And in the new facility, three or 400 people in that gym gets loud and it's exciting. But 400 people in a, in a Civic Center is, is you know, just, just a little corner of the, of the whole place. Um, and so as all this happens, you know, as athletics starts on toll, we start hiring full-time staff members. Um, it's brought to the athletic department again that we need to expand and grow some more to grow enrollment. Um, and then that's when, you know, we bring in bowling. Um, and a group of us are in athletics, and we, we, we bring in bowling, and men and women's bowling is there. And we don't know that, you know, what's going to happen. I think we all know now our men's bowling team, but we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, in the 06 07 season, we're kind of rolling along with things. Um, men's basketball is about to win a conference uh, championship in that, that spring. And then we find out just later that men's bowling, out of nowhere, with seven freshmen, qualifies for nationals. And it's our first team that's headed to nationals. And, you know, the, the department really doesn't know what to do at that point. First team, we've never had a national qualifier. We're not really sure what to do. You know, we, we're trying to book flights. We're trying to get all this stuff, you know, through. Our men's, you know, basketball team just wins conference. It's a great year. You know, it's a great sticking year um, for us in, 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 in athletics. Um, men's bowling goes down to Florida. And uh, we start watching the online feed of, of what's going on, and we don't we don't even realize they're about to win a few matches here. So you know they, they lose the first one, they go win two straight. And we don't know really what's going to happen. They end up losing, but uh, it's the start of it's the start of 12 straight years of going to nationals for men's bowling, and they're and they're and they're the longest streak right now in, in college bowling. Um, men's basketball wins their first conference, you know. Uh, regular season championship. Uh, everybody's awarded rings. So as the, the department grows, it's legitimized by the fact that, um, you know, in athletics, the hardware of a trophy and rings is, is what makes it special to you. And so uh, rings are awarded. Um, and, and then the department kind of, you know, sits still for a minute. Um, we have a lot of athletes, you know, we're 200 plus athletes at this point. And, you know, we don't have our, we don't have a facility on campus. We're still at the Civic Center. Uh, we're borrowing Kelly Met High School for baseball. We're at Standard Diamonds uh, for softball, where if the ball's hit on top of the roof of the building, the people in the one dugout have to wear helmets because the ball rolls off and hits you in the head as you're not paying attention. Um, and so there's all these little, you know, there's all these little quirky stories, you know, um, about those facilities that make, you know, the athletes today and the athletes that, you know, help start the program very different. You know, it's different memories, it's different things shared. Um, you know, a lot of teams take coach buses now. I can, I can tell you a story about men's volleyball where uh, we drove to Nebraska. Um, we were playing, 
playing at Peru State out in the middle of the cornfield. We drove an hour into the cornfield on a college beer in the middle of the cornfield. Uh, and you go to their gym. I, you know, I talked about us being in the basement. Well, you actually walked into the basement of this facility and a gym appears. Uh, so we play this, we play this match. Um, and after we're done, we all think we're going back to the hotel. And the coach says, uh, no, we have a match tomorrow morning at noon in, in, uh, in Wichita. So we get in the vans and we drive through the night and we basically sleep in the vans through the night and go play the next match the next day. Had never been to a hotel yet. So, you know, I mean, things have evolved quite, you know, quite well here. Um, as we look to 2009 and 10, we decided to start uh, dance. Um, uh, right before that track and field, uh, track and field comes in about 07, 08, um, but really wrestling and dance are the next two, two big two big ads. And the reason I say they're big ads is they're, they're very, they've become very successful. Uh, wrestling has had a couple national uh, All-Americans, national qualifiers. Uh, dance has uh, been to nationals four or five different times now um, throughout their history. So, you know, in that short period of 18 years, the athletic department has grown uh, to, you know, somewhere between 250, 300 athletes, depending on the years. Uh, 19 athletic teams, uh, part of the NAI, USBC. Uh, we've had All-Americans, we've won conference championships. Um, and you know it's it's really grown, it's really grown, and that's kind of you know that's kind of the brief, that's kind of the brief history of it, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously over 18 years there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to go. So, um, can I answer any questions for anybody? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Would that increase the day students, the athletic program? So it did. Um, so in the fall of in the fall of, in the fall of 2000, um, when they started basketball, it brought about 25. Uh, full-time traditional students that were, were daytime students. Now, as we say daytime students, we have to remember that college is is highly you know filled with students that are night class students. So a lot of those students that would be normal day students are taking night classes because that's what the college offered. Um, and as we increase that enrollment, so as we go into that year of 0102, we look at 25 athletes all the way into about 75 athletes, you know, kind of overnight. And if you go to 2005, that's when you're almost at about 200 athletes total. So in a four year span, you know, you moved from being you know, traditionally night to having 200 full time students that need day classes because practices at night, competitions at night. So in four years, you know, uh, an academic dean had to figure out how to you know, still offer all those night classes because you still have those students there and offer everything during the day to accommodate those athletes. Today, what, 245 and about 70% of the traditional students? Are yeah, about 245 athletes and we're in the, we're in the high 60s, about almost 70% uh, athletes and non-athletes. So. And I have another yeah, question please. about the um, bill ring itself. You said remodeled from BP Amico. What what did you remodel? This building? What what was it? Oh, when you started, what what did you remodel? Good question. Huh? Yes, uh, this building. A good question to ask. Uh, this yeah, this building that we're for tearing. It had to do with tearing down walls. Uh, the second and third floor because. All of the floors looked like, well, five today, you know, just a, a central, a narrow central corridor with offices on either side. And if you have a second and third floor kind of were extensively redone for classrooms. And the second biggest cost was the open stairway on the outside, which, uh, uh, which was not here when Amico you know, had the building but it was needed for emergency exits with all the students. And we used to have, um, on a given evening, over 600 students enrolled in evening classes on a, on a given night, Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday. In Friday, the number was still pretty high, you know, maybe about 500 um, at, uh, at its peak. But... The, the two, there were two stairways on the side, on the east and west side of the building, small stairways, but uh, they were not judged adequate for an emergency exit. Those were the biggest expenses. Now, there were others uh, as well, renovations. And basically, this benefice right here was what you started with, correct? Correct. Right there, there was no carpeting uh, here at the time, yeah. This was the, uh, the the 
sixth floor with the seventh floor penthouse was the uh, old A and E building, administra administration and engineering, and this where we are now was called the ENR, engineering and research, and this was all an open area at the time. You know, there weren't uh, you know the kind of classroom divisions that uh, that we have now. It was all an open area. And the college had some facilities in the building, which is, was torn down next door, the 2500, a communication center, a very good one at the time, but th there, was, uh, there was some cost for remodeling and renovation there too. If you, if you ever want to see a, an original, uh, how the kind of building was laid out, it's very in shape here in the enrollment department and you're walking back towards the chapel. Uh, if you're standing right in front of the, the reception desk for enrollment, you'll see a door that would enter yourself into uh, the Registrar of Diane Francis' office. That area is very different at the time. So that, that door was actually a, a doorway and not a true door. And there was a mini hallway that ran next to the main hallway. So the main hallway you walked down was just a main through hallway. And there was a mini hallway next to it so that people walking through the main hallway would not interrupt offices. And so there was only spots that you could go into the wall and then you'd walk in the mini hallway to get into all those offices. <laughs> well, we tore down that wall of the offices and just brought it out to the did main wall and put doors in. You, you did. It was very, it's very interesting the layout. Um, I actually just learned that recently when I was uh, looking through office space and things and some of the original plans they showed, you could see those little mini hallways off to the left and the right so people didn't interrupt. But that is an original spot of kind of how it worked, you know, in there. And there's not many of those left. Yeah, where, where your office and uh, others are located. <coughs> when the college first acquired the building, Father McCabe, who was president, conducted some tours. And uh, I went along on uh, one of the tours, and when we saw what the building looked like, it was it was, you know, dusty, dingy, and all that, because uh, because Amerco had been gone for a while. But that first floor, I'll never forget. It it housed. It was open area, unlike the others. A wide, big open space, and it housed uh, an old-fashioned mainframe computer. And there were some pieces, uh, remnants of it still left, you know, but uh, that, that's what it housed a, a huge computer. Right. So as, as you asked about facilities, I, I, did, I did mention the athletic facility, but yeah. uh, the athletic facility was a, was a um, capital campaign um, and it was built uh, sometime between 2008 and 2009. Uh, the first practice was held there on August 31st of 2009, and we did our grand opening September 17th of 2009. Um, we actually didn't move the coaches' offices from the basement to there until Christmas break of the, of the um, fall of 2009 and into January of 2010. So there were still four months where we had an operational athletic building that we were using for practices and athletes and things, and yet our offices were still in the basement. So it was still a little bit of a process, and they... They, I don't want to say they rushed to get it done, but they, they moved quickly to get it done for us. So. That's right, 2009. Yep. The building. Okay. And it's named after Rittenmeyer, the Rittenmeyer Athletic Center. Yes. Go ahead. Walter, when did the college sell the other buildings that are located around us? And was that in response to other financial issues over time? Yes, the original, uh, the original plan and thought was that uh, there were multiple buildings, as, as you well know, that, uh, the uh, old 2,500 buildings. At one time, there were 17, but this, but this building was considered two. The 2,500 was considered four buildings, but anyway, yeah, the college, uh, the, the intent was to create an endowment for the school, rent, uh, rent those uh, buildings, rent so office space, uh, industrial space, whatever, in those buildings, but uh, it never worked out. The expenses always overran the revenue by quite a, by quite a bit. So the and Amico was supplying heat and utilities from the plant at that time, but they stopped doing it in 1982. So the tenants, you know, had to move out. You know, or, or had to get their own, uh, buy the building, get their own heating and cooling systems then. So the college uh, sold, uh, sold off the buildings. And to uh, begin to make, make payments on the debt as well. Does that make sense? Enough. Uh, 
triumph question. Yeah. For you. Yeah. So you talked yeah. about you know the mid '80s and, and the school yeah. was closing and the payroll. What was the feeling of faculty and staff here? Were they aware of it? Did they know this was going on? I mean, I'm sure there were some bright people that realized enrollment was down. There might be some trouble, but did they realize the extent of it? Uh, I that's a. I don't think anyone realized the full extent, or there, there very few people did. But yes, uh, everybody was aware that there was a problem. Faculty were sending out resumes. Uh, um, and just very, there was a great feeling of tension, insecurity. You know, how long will our jobs last? And, yeah. That's what I, yeah, there definitely was. Um, not a very good atmosphere at all. <coughs> and the pay was low, racist. <laughs> so it was, it was rough. Yeah, the college sold off the buildings for whatever prices it could get, and much less than what they were supposed to be worth, uh, too. So, this was uh, this was an industrial park. Namco had, you know, res their labs, research and laboratory facilities. Uh, just a lot of buildings for various purposes. So. I showed it last, uh, a diagram last time. I can remember. Anything else? All right, thank you. All right, that was good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Six o'clock. Six o'clock, right? Yeah, on the top, right. Um, next month, on November sixth, we'll have um, Nat Miller here uh, to uh, speak. He's the director of conservation for the Audubon Great Lakes, um, and he'll be talking about the organization's efforts in the region. Um, actually, he he kind of works. Um, all of the Great Lakes, so he's not uh, here in Chicago uh, all the time, but um, he'll be here and some of his um, projects over the past couple of years is uh, concerned uh, the Wolf Lake watershed and he'll be talking about those as, as well as uh, other efforts in the area. Um, and that's about it. Does anyone have it, any announcements to add? To, um, otherwise, we'll uh, conclude the, uh, the forum um, and see you next month.